So welcome everyone to the Touch Your Life Foundation's panel on um, financial freedom and how it contributes towards the SDG5, which is the gender equality. Um, I hope you all find this panel very useful. We have some brilliant panelists, so looking forward to the conversation. Um, we have Jennifer, we have Olu and Manju, and I would love them to introduce themselves, but I'll just give a quick introduction of myself. My name is VG Surya Devara. I'm based out of California, uh, Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and a technologist. Uh, I've started two uh, startups in tech field, raised funding and uh, got acquired. Uh, I also am in the leadership of other startups right now and I advise uh, startups and um, I do some angel investing too. And this particular topic is truly something that I care about. I think it's so important for women uh, to have financial freedom, uh, to be able to achieve gender equality. Having been in the space of entrepreneurship, that's something that um, I believe that it makes a tremendous difference in the ability of women to decide what makes uh, them uh, successful or happy or productive in life only when they have financial freedom. So with that said, I'm again excited to host this panel and thank you so much for Tal Radio team for asking me. And now I would like to ask our brilliant uh, panelists here. All of them are exciting people, have achieved a lot in their own, uh, in their own fields. Uh, please do introduce yourself, tell us your background, where you come from, where you uh, are and uh, you know, what you would like the, uh, our audience to know about you. We'll start with Jennifer and then Olu and then Manju. Jennifer. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here to be uh, with our uh, distinguished panelist. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Bowie. I'm now stationed in uh, around Washington DC area, but I was trained as a physician back in China uh, initially, uh, and then I came to US and I became a epidemiologist. Nowadays, I think everyone knows that epidemiologist <laughs> because of COVID-19. So we, I do a lot of work on disease prevention, but before COVID, I did quite a lot of HIV prevention, especially uh, reaching out to the underserved population. Uh, so we did quite a few studies in uh, China, Myanmar, Vietnam, uh, mostly focusing on women who are on the move, uh, migrants from rural areas to, to cities uh, and cross-border migrants. Uh, so now I'm teaching uh, epidemiology global health at the Georgetown University, uh, the Department of International Health. I'm also a town chair uh, for China policy studies at RAND Corporation. And recently we are picking up a new project on gender equity in Asia. So this is always by my passion because on my uh, health work, I always, I interviewed um, you know, hundreds and thousands of women who are uh, you know, moved from rural areas to, to cities. They are in the city, they have facing a lot of difficulties, but I, I see a optimism in them. Uh, so I think that's very important for them to be financial freedom, even though you know their situation is difficult. So I can elaborate later, um, but that's just as me, my introduction. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome. We have a physician who is also an epidemiologist and a professor. Amazing, amazing. So Olu, please go ahead. Thank you, VG. Thank you, ladies. It's always wonderful to be in the room with VG. She brings a lot of positive energy and um, you never can tell what VG will come up with next. So be, just beware. <laughs> she could take us to the moon next. <laughs> it's, uh, it's wonderful being here and um, having to meet, you know, amazing women and men in the room and the opportunity to be part of this great panel is for me uh, a dream come true to talk about gender equality, talk about women empowerment and how we can up the um, up our game also in amplifying you know what we do and also amplifying their voices so in a nutshell i'm a licensed financial advisor and educator uh, licensed from the 
province of Ontario in Canada. I live in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. I'm also a storyteller. Um, Vigi loves my poems. She loves my storytelling series. I currently uh, host a storytelling series for entrepreneurs because I'm a serial entrepreneur on another side, uh, which is a very uh, dear venture to me as I am in the process of launching an initiative that brings stakeholders within the ecosystem, in the Canadian ecosystem for entrepreneurs, particularly for women entrepreneurs, because my passion has always been to empower women, empower women entrepreneurs. Uh, before I hand over the baton, I wanna say that I've had uh, a state I have had experience in, in, in leadership in the politics of my country, my native country, which is Nigeria. I, I always call myself in a, in a funny way, an accidental politician. And uh, I serve my state government and my local government um, as a supervisory counselor for primary health care. And that was where I became intimate with the, the problems that women face in terms of the in inequalities, in terms of lack of access to basic um, you know, infrastructure, uh, um, when you talk about uh, you know, lack of healthcare uh, services and system, that was where I saw in the rural areas how you know, the lack of all these um, you know, uh, health facilities can become um, uh, can result to maternal mortalities and infant mortalities, and that kind of spurred my 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 mission to to support um, women. And in in all of that, I want to say that I am so grateful for the opportunity to have been able to work across diverse um, sectors, diverse industries, and being able to be recognized by Co Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. You know, giving me a, a congressional uh, recognition award in 2015 for my work with women, uh, for my work in politics, for my work, you know, as, as an author of five books. And so I consider it a privilege to be a woman, to be able to um, you know, give to the world all that embodies um, women. So I believe that when women are given that opportunity to be who they are and what they can bring to the table, the world will become a better place to be. Thank you, uh, Viji, and back to you. Oh, amazing. I forgot about the fact that you were a politician too. It's just, I think Olu's resume is so rich that it's hard to define her, you know, and absolutely you should listen to her spoken word poetry. She's an amazing poet and also her series, which are on LinkedIn, you can find them. Uh, really amazing uh, interviews and panels that she does. So Lovely Thank to you. have you here, Olu. I Thank think it's, it's a Power Pack panel. And the last of our Power Pack panel is Manju. Uh, Manju Lata, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Right. <clears throat> um, hello, everybody. My name is Manju Kalanidhi. Uh, I come from Hyderabad, known to be the land of Bhagmati, Biryani, Badminton, and Bahubali. Uh, 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 I have been a journalist for the last 18 years or more. Uh, and uh, I've been a mainstream English media journalist. Uh, and uh, I've focused a lot on uh, communities, gender. Uh, I mean, as part of our stories, uh, city stories and Sunday magazine stories, we always focus on women. So somewhere in between, as part of the work, you always get a peek into their lives, what kind of uh, freedom they enjoy, what kind of financial freedom they enjoy. And uh, you know what is the what is the general feel of it? How bad is the gender is the gender uh, bias in India? Uh, you know the, the gender inequalities. Where does it show up? Uh, does it show up in in you getting better education? Does it show up in you choosing for a job, choosing your life partner? So many so many ways. Uh, I hope to be able to uh, give you insights into that. I have also been um, a panel member uh, to choose the finalists of a scholarship given by uh, L'Oreal Paris. Uh, so I have been uh, uh, you know, on their uh, panel for the last four years. And this scholarship was especially given to Indian girls with STEM, uh, STEM education. Uh, it was to kind of find out how passionate they are about future education and then give the scholarship. So as part of this, every year I would meet at least 200 young 
uh, girls uh, from across uh, South India. And it gave me a real insight into what their dreams, aspirations, and how gender inequality is so seeped into our country that it kind of affects generations uh, together. Thank you. Amazing. Again, you know, I, I can't thank you all enough for being here and thank the TAL radio team for having me here because uh, it's always inspiring to hear stories of other women who've achieved so much in your own fields. I think each of you is a bright light. Um, that's it. I, I do want to bring up one thing about an initiative that we are working on. Olu is also part of it. It's called She Speaks Bureau. So we really believe a lot of the women's stories are not getting enough attention. So we've started this nonprofit initiative earlier this year called She Speaks Bureau. And we have, it's a bureau for speakers, female speakers, to have a chance to connect with conferences, events, and other places and panels like this. So I would love to invite each of you because I think your stories are so powerful that you, know, you need to share this more. So more people hear about it, you know. Uh, that said, I would love to start the panel and the topic itself. And the topic is so um, dear, I think, to each and every one of us. You know, one thing that we talked about before starting the panel is how most of us come from uh, a different country or a developing country background and how we've had all to transform ourselves to where we are today. And we will touch that as we go through the panel. But I would like to start off with you know, what does, um, you know, what does financial freedom mean to you? And how do you think it enables the SDG five, which is the gender equality uh, um, aspect of it? So Manju, if we want to start with you, if you could um, tell us what you think and how you think this is important, and then we'll go around and ask uh, Jennifer and then Olu. Please go ahead, Manju. All right. Um... So I think very early in my life, uh, say around seven or eight years, uh, you know, when you read books like father is the head of the family, you know, in India, a lot of textbooks still say that. Uh, so it kind of sparked a question in me, like, why is the father the head of the family? Why not the mother? Why not the brother? Why not me? Why can't I be the head of the family? Uh, I guess uh, my interest in in like who, who find kind of, channelizes or who steers the family was uh, the question uh, arose in me and uh, that's when I had a talk with my mother and uh, she said uh, that because father earns uh, he gets to be the uh, you know, head of the family now that was like a really uh, a shocking thing is like okay so if you earn money you can head a family you can head a community you can head so my first introduction to uh, I guess financial independence was that first you need to have money in your hand to be able to do something. Uh, then, of course, as as I as and when I grew, uh, you would see family, uh, you know, family, uh, for example, uh, you, you know, you would hear about uh, an aunt who had to who could not uh, say that she would not want to get married because the question was, OK, but she can say she doesn't want to get married, but who's going to take care of her? She's going to be a liability to the family. I don't think we can afford this. She has to get married. She better get married in the next one or two years. Uh, so then it hit me that, OK, so when you get married, uh, also when you get married is also something that your financial independence uh, dictates. I mean, if you were a, if you were earning, I don't think your family would want to push you out because you are not a liability. Uh, who you marry, uh, where you work, uh, where you work, how far do you go for your work? Almost, I've heard of a family saying that, oh, but she hardly her earns anything, so she should just go to you know the nearest uh, uh, office that she can go. Why should she go travel? Uh, you know. 20 miles for a, for a job, she hardly earns anything. So it kind of hit me that financial independence is related, is connected to almost every decision of your life. And, and more so uh, in the case of women, because in India, women have started working, I would say in the last 50 years or even lesser than that. And women still do not have a lot of, offices, a lot of corporates. So for a long, long time, 
uh, women in India have always been financially dependent on their fathers, spouses, maybe sons. Um, and, and it does affect every single uh, decision of your, of your life. Uh, and even today, like, like in the year 2021, I still see women who are educated, who are probably postgraduates in, in STEM and who could have probably been earning like, you know, been, been able to earn enough to support a family. I'm surprised that they still come to me and say that, uh, you know, I really want to get out of this marriage. Uh, because uh, I, I don't have any financial freedom. Uh, I can't take a decision of, of uh, you know, where to put my son or my daughter or, and it, it hits you much more, not when you want to buy a, a piece of clothing, not when you want to buy a new phone, not when you want to buy a designer bag, but it hits you badly when you have to perhaps uh, take your mother out for some diagnostic tests and it costs you a few thousand rupees. Uh, that's when you probably, you know, discuss with your husband and say, I want to take my mom for this. And he's like, oh, but you are the daughter. And, and besides, I'm the one who gives money. Why can't you ask your, your brother to do this? So a lot of, you know, the, the whole financial independence thing is intertwined in our culture. And uh, I think we all need to make a start on, on you know, I, I guess right from the time a, a girl child is born we need to kind of instill uh, in them that financial independence is most most important oh that's that's a great great segue i think uh, what you said was uh, was funny but also insightful that as a young child you said you know why can't i be the head of the family and the answer was because your dad is earning the money so he should be the head of the family I think that kind of brings back that whole conversation of gender equality, right? Um, we all fundamentally believe women provide value as being homemakers, right? Nobody can dispute that because that's part of what value society requires. However, that value is not, um, not recognized in a financial way. And so we all, um, the women in general, uh, not the women on this panel, but women in general, um, do not get recognized for the value they provide to their families or their society, because everything is tied to what money are you earning? Yeah. So, um, you know, just uh, before I ask uh, Jennifer and Olu to answer, I, I, it really struck me that I was thinking about this one study somebody did I believe in UK where they said, if we take all the work women do in the household, most women, I think there are some families where there's more equality and where men and women both participate in the home. In fact, the kids too participate in the chores at home. But very often in the world, it happens that women are the ones who are the primary caregivers. Women are the ones who are the primary uh, ones who are cooking for the family, shopping for the family, uh, doing other things. But if you put financial value on each of them, you realize, suppose you had to hire somebody to do each of that work, how much would you pay for it? And somebody put a value on that. And because there is no financial transaction happening for that, so it's never recognized, right? It's, uh, a woman's work never finishes when they start in the morning to late in the night, but uh, that's a fantastic uh, a way to start this conversation. The fact that not only can you not have any influence in about your own life, but you don't have much say about what happens in your family or what happens to your kids or any other decision. So thank you so much, Manju, for that fantastic answer. And Jennifer, if you could go next and then Olu. I'll just add quickly, I can't, I cannot agree more with both of your uh, comments on this. Uh, so on, I, I would say most of the societies nowadays, uh, or in the last uh, uh, a few hundred years, uh, most of society are part patriarchal uh, society, that means the system are controlled by men. Uh, so we, uh, in our studies on gender equity uh, in Korea, only in about less than 20 years ago, they abolished this history uh, of law uh, that basically named the men, the men, only men can be the head of, of the family. So even if uh, the, the family, uh, you know, limit to a young son, then that 10 year old will be the head of the family, will be on the deeds, will be on uh, to make decisions. 
So I think the but to, to in order to change that system, will need women to be on the decision making to participate uh, in making policies. So many of the gender equity indices nowadays uh, usually have uh, several components. You know, access to education, access to healthcare. Those are the really the basic uh, for women to function uh, in the society. But there's also one category of uh, index that's progressed the least uh, nowadays, which is the power. So whether women has power to make decisions at home, in the community, in the whole society, how many women are in the parliament? How many women are in, uh, working as judge? Because these are the systems uh, which decides women's position and their decision making. So on the uh, more in intimate side, I interviewed many uh, women uh, moved from rural areas to, to the city. Uh, they, many of them uh, doesn't have to work formal jobs. So they work at home as, as uh, Vicky just said, but uh, they don't have their own income. So when they move to city, they, even though they do very uh, poor jobs or high risk jobs, but then they have a little bit of income. So in, in a way, it's a little bit independent. So I can't tell you how many of them are saying, you know, even though you may pity, pity me what I'm doing in the city, but I'm really happy. I wish my previous life are doing this because now I can uh, give this money for my, my daughter to go to college. You know, I can make decisions on who I want to support and what I want to do. So I just want to say that's uh, a very empowering uh, a tool, uh, which is the financial independence. Oh, that's amazing. The fact that even having that meager income empowers them. I think that's, uh, that's pretty, you know, sad in some ways, but also empowering in some ways, right? We, we think, you know, what little we need to feel that we have a choice, that we have a-, a If I can just add one, one thing on that, the China 20 years ago has the highest suicide rate uh, among the rural women. Um, but that's before, you know, they open up for women to be able to migrate to, to work in the factories. And now that uh, suicide rate has cons uh, consist consistently coming down over the last 20 years, that, uh, that's another epidemic. Yeah. That's awesome. Olu, if you could go next. Thank you um, for the speakers that have gone the, ahead of me. I would want to touch on what Manju, uh, where Manju left off, you know, where I would describe my journey um, and, what I see or how I perceive financial independence or freedom. I come from a very highly patriarchal uh, society system in Africa, in Nigeria, where what was modeled for me in my home, and that is where for, for each woman, for each female, they take a direction as to how they will be financially independent or financially dependent. So for me, what I saw was my dad being the provider and he did that brilliantly um, in the sense that he was the one that worked. He was an engineer, he had his business, he provided for us in terms of you know, providing education, good education. And my mom, on the other hand, didn't work. What she did was stay at home to ensure that we had, uh, we, we, we went to school, we did our homework. And then when it came to taking holidays, my dad, of course, took the lead, uh, would also provide the clothing, the shoes, and the money. And that was what I saw in my home that was modeled. And my dad didn't have any conversation with any of us. He, we are three girls and a, and a boy. Unfortunately, my youngest sister passed in July, in, in July this year. He, his focus was basically on education, just get an education. And of course, get an education to be able to either get educated and then get married that's that was the that was the pattern that was what was expected and of course what i saw was my mom looking up to him for 
every everything and anything you know for instance my grandma would come visit and when she's going my my mom talks to my dad to make provision for her uh, in terms of what she's going to take back to the village to wherever you know she lived so I saw that and because my mom's education is a bit limited in the sense that she didn't go, she didn't have any higher education, but she was she was literate, very literate. So I didn't have the opportunity to come in contact with what money was. I was a daddy's girl. I all my needs were being met. We were chauffeured to school and back and holiday. So to me, I thought money was just anywhere. I could just you know, money just came from anywhere and of course money would come from my dad and then I got married without having the understanding of what how money works and how I should treat money so automatically I replicated what I saw in my home which was my dad owning properties all over the place my mom never having any property to her name she didn't have even even the cars that she drove they were bought by my dad she never had her own money all the money that she could say she had was either my dad giving her an allowance and uh, maybe somebody giving her money but she never owned her own money to buy her own car to have her own property whereas my dad had several properties okay and of course when he died all those properties were in his name, not in the name of my dad and my mom. So this was what I took to my home, my marriage. And what I did was provide that environment like my mom did in the first uh, few years of my, of, my, of my marriage, say the first 15 years, because that was what I did. I concentrated on providing that uh, safe environment, providing that uh, uh, um, you know support to my to my partner to make sure that you know he was advancing in his career and I was staying at home and then you know I didn't I wasn't I wasn't earning because I wasn't taught from an early age what money was and so when I got to the point where I needed to pivot from you know, uh, a paid employment, because of the fact that I was raising three kids at that time in 1999, my, my oldest was about, she was about eight years old, and my youngest was two years old. So when I left paid employment, I went into entrepreneurship, because I, I mean, at that time, it wasn't entrepreneurship, it wasn't that fancy word, entrepreneurship, it was just, I wanted to start my own business. But look at what had happened in years past. I didn't have a savings. I didn't have any property. So I deferred to my dad to bootstrap, to help starting up this business. So you see the patriarchal system also, you know, coming up again to say, okay, how do you help me, you know, doing this? So in, 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 grow, in, in growing that business, I, I had to learn what money is all about. And now being a business person, then rather being a business person, that was the first time I had contact with, you know, having to manage money, having to know how to earn money, having to know this and that. But there were a lot of obstacles. There were a lot of challenges because I was by that time in my mid thirties, um, no properties to myself had had wasted a lot of time a lot of years not being able to gather whatever it is that i could get you know in terms of savings in terms of investment on the other hand my uh partner was also you know he was advancing in his career so when i got to canada the first thing that i promised myself was to understand how money works because I saw the um, challenges that I faced. I saw the things that I missed out. 
um, I saw serial, a series of um, examples. For instance, my late sister, you know, God bless her soul. She she rang me one day and said, "Sis, guess what? Um, that my, me and my husband want to get uh, want to buy a plot of land." And I said, "Oh yes, that's fantastic." And she and he said, "Okay, we're going to put money together." But um, she asked him whose name would be on the title and the husband said of course it's going to be my name you know i'm the guy <laughs> and she said no 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 i'm not having that because if it's if my money is in this then it has to be both of us and you and guess what the husband said if that's going to be the case then we're not buying any land just take your money you know and and that was how they didn't buy that property because he didn't want a property that my sister was going to part fund he didn't want her name on the title. Now she's talking to her sister whose husband has all the titles in his name. <laughs> so what, what that means to me was I promised myself coming to Canada to say the first thing was to get an understanding of how money works. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. So in doing that, I had to get licensed as a financial advisor to understand, not only to teach myself how money works, how to save money, how to grow money and how to protect my money that I have grown as an investment. So I had to first teach myself, understand, get license, and then be able to teach many women because we it's, it's funny how we replicate the generation you know, how my kids, I have two girls and a boy. So I, I, I present them each time. It's like, it's like every day, you guys, do you understand what I'm talking about? You have to earn your money. You have to put this and that. So for me, what is financial freedom? Financial freedom means being able to protect my life, to protect my family in terms of you know, having the, the wherewithal financially to either have a life insurance policy, to be able to have access to money that I can, I can deploy to do whatever I want to do, you know. Also, financial freedom to me means being able to manage or reduce my debts because as women, you know, we find out that we expend you know, in dif different things that we, if I knew what I knew as a financial advisor when I was 25 or 21, believe me, I would be one of the very, re very <laughs> the richest <laughs> people, you know. So yeah. also no. what that means to me is being able to um, grow my money and also protect that money. When I say grow the yeah. money in investment, protect it, that he's transfer it to the next generation because yeah, I, my I dad think, yeah. yeah i think the differentiation is really great that um on one side a lot of women don't have the ability to earn money and so have that freedom but then there is a second part to this which is build wealth yes right yes. And I think that's what you're addressing. And that's a great point because a lot of women, even the ones that I know who are very successful um, and earn money uh, they never manage their money. You know, it, it ends up being the husband and the family who is managing the money. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, if they have a divorce or if something else happens where the husband is not in the picture or the partner is not in the picture, suddenly the women are left. Uh, in the, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, I think it's a great point. And I would like to go to the next, uh, next point and I'm, I will come back to this wealth building piece. I think that's a very important aspect. Um, I would love to ask Jennifer to go on this one to say, what are some of the constraints women face in achieving financial freedom? You work with women, as we were speaking earlier, you uh, also mentioned you work with women in so many countries as part of your role um, in, um, you know, in, in the epidemiologic uh, uh, research you were doing, you were looking at women. So if you could explain some of that context and then tell us what you've observed in your own life and the women that you were studying, what you see and what constraints do women in general face in achieving financial freedom, uh, that would be great, yeah. That's a wonderful question, right? So if we know how to empower ourselves uh, from early on, uh, as Wulu uh, just mentioned, I think we will choose that. 
but I think you know, maybe the number one uh, barrier would be the, the social norm. So we are all limited by the environment we are, uh, especially growing up uh, as a child, as an adolescent, as a young woman, we often influenced by peer pressure. So it's really very much dependent on which society, what type of society we were, we live in, and what sort of social circles we uh, as, uh, uh, we are com most comfortable with, right? So many of these uh, women I uh, interviewed from rural China, uh, they you know grew up uh, in the village, uh, they get married, they have a, a sort of a normal life. Uh, and, you know, in China, in rural area, they usually have to live in their uh, husband's home. So they bring up the kids, they serve, uh, take care of the elders, of, it's the husband's uh, parents or grandparents. Uh, so they have to work uh, very hard during their uh, youth and in the middle years until, you know, they become a grandma, you know, by that time they enjoy some more respect and they don't have to work so much. But that's the type of a social norm that women are usually accept. Um, so often what we see uh, is women who in that environment but encounter some difficulties. Sometimes it's a husband are addicted to gambling uh, or uh, you know, the, the family is uh, bonded by, by debt uh, and or you know, they uh, experience lots of physical abuse uh, there. So, so that's why the suicide rate was very high. But um, I think the one thing is once they are breaking out of that social norm, you know, if they have opportunity, I, had, I remember this woman told me that she would just want to leave. You know, she just jump on the, she doesn't read. Uh, so she just jump on a train. She doesn't even know where that train goes. <laughs> so the train ended up in Guangzhou, which is the southern city, which, you know, this is at the beginning of the 80s. They just started uh, the factories and so on. So she had a very difficult time in the city, uh, too. But she told us the story as a very uh, inspiring. Uh, uh, basically, she was homeless uh, and, and had to live in the, on, on the street for a while. But then she said, I build everything myself. Now I can go home uh, and, uh, you know, uh, bring, you know, now my family respect me because I can bring back, uh, bring them gift. So, so I think it's that social norm, whether there's an option for women to break out that social norm so that they can, they know there are other options, they have other options. So I think social norm, peer pressure, and that, that's one, uh, big, one big barrier. The other thing I, say, I would say is um, this sense of insecurity, this sense of uh, self-doubt uh, and, and sort of a dependence. Um, I feel that you know, when, when we grow up, at, at the, I think as kids, boys and girls, little girls and boys are almost similar in a way in uh, exploring the world and so on. But once you get to puberty, so the world change for, for men and for women. Uh, so for men, they are usually encouraged to explore, uh, to, you know, to fight, right? Uh, and to, so, so they build this confidence in this encouragement and in the experience. But girls, on the other hand, are usually tell, told, you know, don't go out, you know, don't, you know, don't, you, you, you should stay, be safe. You know, there's lots of danger out there don't trust yourself, you know, you have to rely on someone else. So I think in that forming age, um, women have, have to instill this uh, fear and insecurity in her, and that follows uh, women the rest of their life. So there's always a, a voice there to say, maybe it's not safe for me, right? Maybe I should come back to home. Maybe I should depend on something. Maybe I don't have to work so hard. So I think that voice, um, whenever we meet challenge, uh, often you see women are more likely to give up, uh, more likely to, unless they, they have to do that. So we, we, again, we see many women actually are very strong. They're stronger than what they think. But that self-doubt uh, is another barrier. 
And of course, other things like financial, the family financial situation, access to health, access to education also um, uh, contribute to the, um, to, to the barriers for gender equity. Maybe I'll oh, stop absolutely. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, we can go on, I think, on this topic the whole day because it's such a vast topic and so critical. But I love the point you made around what today we are calling it social conditioning. Uh, but really, that's what it is, right? We are trained not to trust our judgment. We are trained to fear outside. And we are trained to be risk covers. Uh, and we tend to, and sometimes I actually take a step back and uh, question myself. Is it, is it something more uh, a women thing? Because um, is it because we are nurturers and we take care of our babies and so genetically we are predisposed or is it just conditioning? Because I, I keep thinking about this because this happens so often, whether it is women in entrepreneurship or women um, you know, taking a decision about their life when they're in an abusive relationship. Um, you know, they think, oh no, if I go out there, I don't know what it'll be. So I'll just stay here in this, in this bad relationship, right? Um, so, but the point you made around the social conditioning was so brilliant that how uh, those small things that they tell you as a young person defines your whole personality and changes how you see the world. And, you know, it just kind of restricts and puts you in a mental cage in some ways, right? Uh, brilliant point, um, Jennifer, love, love that. I would love to ask Manju and then Olu, uh, to contribute on this question around what are the constraints that are there on women in achieving uh, financial freedoms? Go ahead, Manju. Okay. Um, I think uh, when it comes to financial freedom, uh, it's it's we all need to begin with ourselves, with what we are and who we are. It's always nice to be able to speak you know, uh, rhetorically about women and financial independence. But if you as a person, as I think the moment you turn an adult, uh, which is whatever depends on each country, uh, you should you should strive to be financially independent. It is mandatory for, for this to happen. You, you can be highly educated. It could be based on your skill sets. Uh, photography, uh, cooking, uh, uh, whatever, even even handiwork, needlework, thread work, whatever it is. Uh, I think uh, just as um, in India, uh, you are always trained to kind of, uh, you know, how, how the Indian scenario is, you, you get educated, you finish your graduation, then you get married, then you have children. I mean, this holds good for men as well. So somewhere uh, only a few a very minuscule population will do something different. But otherwise, it's ingrained in our uh, psyche that this is how it should be. And we should start catching them young uh, when it comes to financial independence. It has to be impressed upon young girls and their parents that it is part of their identity. Whatever it is, you can do in any which ways. But financial independence has a lot of, it's not just to buy a sari, not just to buy a piece of jewelry. It goes much, much uh, beyond that. I've seen women who also say, I don't need financial independence. You know, my husband earns a lot. And, uh, and uh, you know, he, he's very nice. He's a very nice person. He gives me money. Uh, but I don't know, would, would he give money for a cause that you believe, but not he believes? And are you willing to give that up? Uh, so these are the things. So like I said, one should start at their own, um, you know, start with themselves. So in my case, uh, I thought that financial independence also means that you make your own decision. So when I had to buy my car uh, five years ago, uh, my husband, uh, of course, did come and say, hey, come on, let's choose. I said, thank you so much for everything. But I want you to step back here. I want you to help me make a decision, but the decision is going to be mine, whether I buy an auto gear, <laughs> whether I buy a, you know, a geared one. Yes, including the color, the make, the machine. The So I spent nearly 10 days um, <laughs> looking up all the tech terms, understanding what is horsepower, how does it differ? What is the, you know, CC of an engine, <coughs> sorry. So it, it felt very empowering uh, to be able to um, 
you know, make my own decision. And trust me, buying my car four years ago has been the best decision, most empowering decision uh, that I have made. And of course, I pay for it. I paid for the down payment. I pay for the EMI. Uh, but it was quite possible that my husband could have stepped in and decided everything for me and say, okay, this is the one that you buy. I know better than you. Then I said, no. Financial independence also means that I should be able to uh, take my, uh, make my own decision. And uh, most recently, when we bought a piece of land, uh, I ensured, I mean, uh, we both ensured that we had half an acre in, in that. In fact, uh, the, the registration officer, the land registration officer was surprised. He said, you guys are a couple and you still want the property divided. Uh, but I think maybe it's good training that I gave. <laughs> also, of course, his own, uh, you know, uh, his own uh, decency that my husband said, yes, this is how we want it. We are a couple. We are together. Hopefully we are not going to separate, but we still want our properties to be in different names. So uh, I think, Viji, um, we as women should start uh, like be the change you want to be. So today, my daughter, I have a 16 year old at home, uh, a daughter at home. I have a single, I have a daughter and she is seeing how I make my decisions. And, and I guess that that kind of sets the, the precedent for, for what we want. So be the change you want to be when it comes to financial independence. Absolutely. I think that's the great thing in this panel, each person from Jennifer to you, um, Jennifer being a physician and uh, epidemiologist and a professor and Manju, you being a journalist and uh, uh, fighting for the rights of women starting from home. And of course, Olu, who's had uh, a brilliant career, both as an entrepreneur and a politician, and now as, you know, um, so many other things that she does. I think we are, and myself, you know, um, I have been uh, an entrepreneur and I've had a success. <laughs> what is kind of funny was when my first company got bought um, and it, nobody in India understood what an exit meant. So when I went to India, <laughs> And right after the exit happened, and this was a public exit, so a lot of people knew that something happened, that, you know, she sold the company. And the, my dad's friends came to uh, commiserate, saying that, oh, it seems you sold your company as if it was a terrible thing, you know. And I didn't know how to tell them, no, I made good money, you know. I didn't say anything. Yeah, I said, yeah, I know. It's okay. You know, I just left it at that. <laughs> So in some ways, I think we are limited by our surroundings. In general, financial knowledge is limited in a lot of communities. Wealth building, that knowledge is limited. And then women in that become even more limited, both in terms of knowledge, access, um, their own insecurities and all the other things we talked about. But Olu, I would love to hear your point too. But Manju, I love the fact that you, you have it in both your names. That's what I do. In fact, one thing to add is when we both got together, my husband is German, by the way. So he's more, a little bit more used to this. His parents were both professors. So he's used to his mom working and he's kind of comfortable. But I wouldn't marry somebody other, otherwise, right? Because I was like, this is something that... I think it's not so much about your money, my money. It's about both of us have a say in this family. Both of us have a say in what happens to us together. And so we've mm -hmm. always maintained separate uh, personal bank accounts, even though we have joint bank accounts. Because I don't have to ask him if I have to spend some money and neither does he have to ask me for the small things, right? Because yeah. we don't ask each other, but the big things, yes, we sit down and talk and, and contribute and we figure out our finances and stuff. But Olu, I would love you to also address this. And then we'll go to the last point around what can we do? And maybe Olu, you can take this and then move to the next point also around what can we do to change the situation, both in terms of personally, I think Manju's point is well taken that each mm -hmm. of us can do certain things. And I think you're a great person who can add to that because as a financial advisor, you have the background yeah. to give advice. Okay. But also I think it is good for us to all think about policies. I do think it's important for us to influence policies. Because mm. if individually one of us gets successful, it's not enough. We should convert that success into uh, other people having a path behind us to become successful, right? We, like we always say in She Speaks Bureau, we say, um, like me, Olu, all of us speak a lot, right? We, get, we got called to conferences. I'm sure Jennifer gets called. Manju, I'm sure you do that too. Um, but 
what we felt is it's not enough this if we are the only ones speaking we want other women who are younger who are newer who are coming from disadvantaged communities who don't have a network where somebody knows them and asks them to come speak to have that chance so we always believe in how do we keep this door wide open for the next generation or the or the other people who are there to come through and to come to this side of the table where we have financial independence, where we have representation, where we have this equality. So Olu, if you could address both the constraints and how can we remove that? And then we'll go around the table Thank one you. more time. Yeah. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you, uh, Jennifer and Manju for those uh, great insight. I would say the first constraint that I want to talk on briefly is on the culture and the tradition, you know, the constraints of what is perceived as what a female or a woman ought to be or what she can own or achieve. So that is a constraint because culture, you know, prevents, prevents a woman from, from taking decisions that that would be perceived as out of, you know, is out of the norm, is out of, is out of context. I want to bring my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, into perspective here. She was who I can say a radical. It was just, it's just lately that I realized who she, who she was. She was a textile merchant. And I realized that growing up, she had her own uh, property where she lived. She she obviously um, left my grandfather because my grandfather had five wives. She's the first wife. So I guess that her independence to have her own business, to own property. I'm talking about my 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 I'm 54. So you can imagine how old at that time, how my grandma ma stood her ground to own her own uh, property to own her own business. So she was ostracized. She was looked on like someone who was out of this is this is not this is not how it's supposed to be. So the culture is a constraint where the culture defines, like Jennifer said, you know, boys can take on uh, challenges, they can go, you know, they can take risks. But when a woman wants to take a risk, She's going to be sh she's going to be shut down right from the home, right from her family, her her parents, her siblings, her cousins, her extended family. This is not how women do. What is your problem? That is how she's going she's going to be you know looked upon. So we see culture and the tradition as one of you know the very foundational. It's very foundational. It has to be uprooted. It has to be changed. And I do believe it is changing gradually. Now, <clears throat> the second constraint that I see is in the curriculum of the education. The curriculum only emphasizes on either you want to be a doctor like Jennifer, you want to be an engineer, you want to be an accountant, you want to be a lawyer or whatever you want to be. But there is nothing in the curriculum that teaches financial education right from the get-go to say two plus two is four and you can do you know, the power of compounding you know um when you invest your money and teach children from an early age to arouse their interest to know how does to become one million, you know, how do I, how do I do that? So there is a gap in the curriculum that ought to be fixed, not only at the high school, but from the, the, the uh, primary level to, you know, even to the university to, to, to you know, to uh, higher, uh, higher institution, the higher level of education. Now, the third uh, constraint that I also want to bring out is the lack of support system, where there is nowhere the woman can go to to say, "Hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking." For instance, when I when I went into politics, I I am an accidental politician, and um, I told my dad. My dad said, "Who who who do you know in politics? Who do you know in the government? You know, if I hadn't if I didn't have." a bodacious, brave, I didn't have that courage to take on that appointment. I would have been, you know, intimidated with what my dad said. And of course, 
my my partner he didn't support it from the get go from from the beginning he said no this is not happening you know and but I wanted to serve. I wanted to be in a leadership position to be able to help women, to not even women, to to serve, to be a, a to serve people. So you find out that there is, there was no support. There's no support system. I couldn't go back to my mom. My mom never was not a politician. She's just looking. This girl has gone crazy. My daughter has just gone crazy. But we're just gonna leave her to just be crazy, and you know, and let's see where that craziness you know leads her to. So there is no support system and that's why a lot of women who aren't bodacious they they stay back in taking leadership roles in coming out to be able to 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 lead and of course when we when they don't see enough role models there is nothing that would stimulate them you know to 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 take on uh, such leadership roles and one of the um going back to your this the part b of your question which is how do we um you know begin to change the narrative the first thing would be to provide uh financial education at an early stage you know expose children expose females young girls young women you know uh to financial education to educate them on what it means to be to protect your life, you know, protect your health, protect yourself against disability, you know, reduce your, you, you know, reduce or manage debts. Understand what debts is all about. How do you reduce it? How do you not put emphasis on things that are ephemeral, like you know, shoes and bag, like Manju said, and begin to look at investment because that is what you know, uh, in, in, that is what means it, to build wealth rather than building wealth, you know, acquiring shoes, acquiring bags, acquiring cars, those things are not wealth. They're not, they're not the things that you can, you can lay hold of, you know, when you retire. So we begin to look at providing such financial um, education. And then also I see the second point being encouraging um you know effective and full participation of women of girls in in taking leadership roles and exposing them you know to the opportunities to the different opportunities i never there was nobody in my family that went into politics so i was i was like the the black sheep of my family like what in the world was she, is she thinking about you know so it made me feel like i was doing something that I wasn't meant to do, but in my mind, I knew that this is, this is, this is the right thing. I wanted to serve. So being able to expose them, you know, gives other children, you know, you know, women the opportunity to see how you know it's done. So when when we women like us who are in leadership uh, positions, we need to amplify what we're doing and encourage and provide opportunities either for volunteer or to to train them or to to support them provide that support system and the third and final thing that i want to say is also to to educate um you know boys and girls on the shared responsibility you know in the home to understand you know what it means you know when it's a gender equality it's not about the boy going to get the money and the girl having to be subservient you know uh, because we we come from a generation where for instance my partner you know he's he's the only son the first the first boy the only son and his mother doted on him he didn't have to do anything like zero you know he was he was raised not to lift a finger he was raised he has three sisters who who catered to his needs so if i at some point wanted to say okay i'm not i'm not i'm done with this then i become um a wife that's not you know uh, 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 how would i call it uh, somebody who he, he's not he's not comfortable with what, what what's happening the girls in my life you know always took care of my needs so why won't you be like them so we need to educate our boys and our girls you know not just say boys you know learn about cars learn about investment you know we're saying but also balance it you know in educating them shared responsibility shared um you know investment you know going for financial independence let's educate both both sexes let's educate them let's provide them with the roadmap that would you know leave the dependence of women on on men and make men more 
um, responsible to value what women bring to the table. For instance, what, what Vijay said, the years that I that that we put together in raising our kids, monetizing that, believe me, if that was put in an investment, I can tell you, um, most of us here, we would be very rich billionaires by now. So back to you, Vijay, I hope I was able to say something on that. Oh, you're, you're brilliant as usual. I love all the three points you talked about. One is around education, two is around encouraging in leadership, and three is the support system and also kind of bringing this concept to both men and women. So I would love, Jennifer, I know we are running a little late, but this is such a brilliant conversation. So hopefully the TAL radio team is okay, but I would love to get both Jennifer and Manju's feedback on this topic too, as to what can we do to change this, change the constraints that are there for women to, to have financial freedom. We'll start with Jennifer and end with Manju. Yeah, I, I will not repeat what Wulu said, which I, I again, I completely uh, agree. Uh, and I think sometimes when, when I'm facing difficulty, uh, one little voice in my mind is that I want to be a role model for my daughter, right? <laughs> so uh, I think role model networking are both very, uh, uh, it, it's really what we need. I'm also thinking about you know, what society can do for women uh, because we know uh, a country, a society uh, that treating women well and releasing this type of energy and wisdom uh, and uh, innovation that you often see a, 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 a educate, uh, the economic uh, flow, affluent uh, society. So I think this uh, feed into each other. Uh, so I think a society that can value what women do at home, uh, as Vicky uh, Vigi mentioned earlier, we all do uh, probably more proportion of housework at, at home, no matter, you know, even if we say go to the country with high, the best gender equity index, you don't, you still see women doing a little bit more. But uh, how would uh, society treat that? You know, do we uh, have the care uh, credits you know, to women? Do we provide uh, uh, you know, uh, pre the paternal uh, leave? So when, we when the family, the couple has a baby, can both mother and the father has uh, some leave time to take care of the baby? When someone is ill at home, can both men and women get the credits to leave from, from uh, the work uh, to take care of the family so that it's not a norm that's only pointing to women who has to be uh, the, uh, the, the, the primary caregiver. So I think that those will be relatively subtle policy changes, but actually can uh, help women's confidence to say, you know, my career is also important. It's not that I always have to put, you know, my career on the hold when something happened. And we see that with COVID-19, you know, with many countries that lots of women are stopped working uh, in their jobs um, because uh, to take care of family. So, yeah. so I just uh, want to highlight some of these policies may help women. Oh, that, that's that's such a great ad. I do agree with you. You know, the, one of the things that I love a lot of the policies in the United States, right? I love a lot of the values that are in India and policies too. But when I came here, I was so surprised to find out there's no maternity leave. Forget about paternity leave. You know? it's like in one field, I think US is so behind every almost every other country in the world, which is kind of sad. Uh, but I'm hoping, like you said, right, not only maternity leave, parental leave, as we're discussing today, um, that it's, it's uh, of course, the, you know, the, the mom who had the baby obviously needs time to recoup and bond with the baby, take care of them. But the father also can take leave and spend time with the child and raise them. And I think those kinds of policies, we should push for them. Uh, somehow in gender equality, we forget that um, the equal pay aspect, right? That could be a whole another session because I've spoken about this in other, in other conferences, even in tech world where we think we try to be as, as equal as possible. Still, there is a huge gap in the gender uh, uh, or equal pay. 
uh, some of that is driven by these things that women have to take a break to take care of their kids because there is no support system for it. And then they lose out in those promotions. And then there's a whole another topic around that women don't negotiate and so many other things that we can talk about. But I do want to give Manju a chance also. But thank you so much, Jennifer. I love the points you made around public policy and how that can also help change the impact on women. But Manju, if you could also add your your thoughts around, you know, what can we do? And I know you're very passionate about personal change too, uh, but both personal and professional. You as a journalist, I'm sure you meet tons and tons of people. And you also probably look at the effect of policy or culture on what happens to individuals. Uh, so I would love your perspective and then we'll close off uh, the panel. I would have loved to get maybe one word or one sentence in the end from each of you, one tip, uh, to just close off everything as to what is the one tip that you would give. But Manju, if you could go first. Uh, yes, so uh, like you did mention, I think I've been lucky to have had the kind of education, be able to put my foot down and you know marry the kind of person, kind of set a tone to myself, uh, but not many would be. I know that I do come from the privileged lot, uh, but there are scores and scores of uh, young girls who don't get financial independence because they don't earn, because they may not have education or uh, there's so many other uh, you know, socio-cultural, economic uh, reasons. Uh, I think the best best start for this is uh, just as the government mandates a few things, like you can take your decisions as an adult only from this age, uh, or that the, the marriageable age uh, is now 18 or 21 for men, women, or whatever uh, those things are. Uh, or you'll, you know, there are these, these mandatory things that are laid down, like, like the rule of the law. Uh, I wish there is, I mean, it's not impossible to, where uh, there is some kind of a policy where every girl at least spends two years working, building up her or his, building up her skill. It could be great money, it could be small money, but I think it should teach them the culture all of going to work, culture of um, commitment to work. Uh, and then know what to do with, with your money. Like Olu just mentioned, it's not simply about earning money. It's about what do you do with what you earn? How do you make it work for you? Uh, regardless of, I mean, uh, there are women who do take maternity leave and they may want to, uh, you know, chill out after that. So how do you kind of make sure uh, you invest uh, that in a right way? Uh, and yes, India is very lucky in terms of maternity leave. In fact, I think the government sector has Two years of paid leave, two years, yes, 24 months of paid leave, uh, although that that uh, works only for the government sector, not for the private sector. Uh, so uh, even private sector, I think it's four months now. Uh, so it's pretty incredible that we, we have these kind of things. Um, and, and the policy should mandate that women should study, should apply. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of corporates that give you equal opportunity. Uh, I mean, you, you don't have to be a man to apply uh, for that. So those opportunities should be used by uh, young girls. I have seen so many girls who don't even make a try uh, saying that, you know, anyway, I'm going to get married uh, and my parents will influence my job. I may have to quit my job. Uh, what's the point? I will do once for all. Uh, first, let me settle down. So I think a certain amount of, uh, you know, lethargy at their end uh, also uh, kind of matters. So I think first important is to insist that girls get good education. I think that itself uh, can change your mindset towards what do you do with the education? How do you use for yourself? How do you use for the society? So once you are educated, you are confident, you can work, that gives you more confidence, that gives you the freedom to dictate, including things like, no, I'm 21, I don't want to get married, I'm not a liability for anybody, I am going to earn for these many years, and then I, I decide. Uh, so Vichy, I think um, a, a skill development were from the government side would be a great way because the moment you you kind of get skills you are employable and once you get a taste of uh, financial independence it's very tough to kind of come out so uh, so the government of india and the state of telangana have been doing skill development 
uh you know especially in in telangana we have something called a v hub which is the women entrepreneurial hub which uh, which kind of encourages women with small funds to be able to do anything they want it need not be that you are a doctor engineer journalist you could be uh, just a person who loves uh, who loves clothes and you can set up your own boutique and and earn money uh, so there are things that are happening but uh little like they say uh, too late too little we need to kind of push that push the envelope uh every girl should be mandatorily educated and given a chance to work and there should be specific policies where women are hired uh for example uh i mean there are many sectors where where there is uh, where there where where a company takes pride in recruiting women in fact i think they even have some kind of a, a government subsidy to kind of encourage women or the disabled or the marginalized community so yes specific policies to recruit women i remember how the international indian school of business isb had a specific program where they trained 10000 women to become entrepreneurs and trust me that that kind of a thing it means 10000 women it probably means has impacted 40000 people and the entire family whoever it is so such kind of policies are most welcome thank you so much i think the point you made in the end that even private organizations can influence by providing specific programs targeted towards women uh on in all levels of society and that's another point you've been making consistently that not only educated like you know a, a professional women but also women who uh, are on the lower end of the spectrum need help to develop skills so they can become financially independent so love the three perspectives all of you brought in i love the fire in each of you and your experience and your thoughts uh, it was an amazing panel i think i can go on like this for like 5 6 hours <laughs> but i think the ladies in uh, jennifer and olu are uh, it's quite late for them and manju i think it's early in the morning for you i would love to close this with uh, one sentence each what tip you have uh for our audience about financial freedom for them personally if you have one tip for them one sentence so we can close it off we'll start with uh, we'll go back this way so manju if you have one tip for uh, our audience uh the future is female and financial independence will get you there awesome love it and olu your next thank you vg i would say educate yourself on how to make money on how to save money on how to grow money on how to protect your money awesome that's loving lovely jennifer yes uh i would say uh you know when meet self doubt uh, be confident uh and believe in yourself and that you can learn uh, i would encourage everyone to learn a new skill you know once in a while don't be afraid that's it awesome and finally from my side i would say value yourself uh, unless you value yourself nobody will value you so each of you is unique each of you have something to contribute to this world both financially personally creatively artistically and your whole self so please do value yourself and do the best in the world and and take somebody forward so thank you again for this wonderful panel amazing women that we met thank here you. manju a journalist a fire brand i love the fire you brought to this conversation olu who shared so much about her journey and true renaissance woman you know from uh, one end to the thank other you. and you. i didn't know that you got the congressional medal it's we are so proud of you that's so amazing and thank of you. course jennifer you know your work is so amazing both in terms of the research you've done which in itself is is uh, commendable but you've kind of looked at the stories behind those numbers while you were researching in an epidemi- epidemiologic way and i think that shows your concern towards those women and those people that you're you're talking to it's a, a lovely people lovely souls and i hope we'll all get to meet each other and we'll all make the change that we're looking for thanks everyone for joining the touche life foundations uh, panel on financial freedom for women and its impact on sdg 5 the gender equality goals um, on the occasion of world kindness day
Uh, it was a wonderful panel and I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.